was the consensus of archaeologists that no megalithic architecture had been found anywhere in the world that was more than 6,000 years old. They said, show us another culture that's 12,000 years old anywhere in the world and we might listen to you. Evidence from much earlier megalithic construction is hiding in plain view. Our understanding of prehistory must change. Nestled near Nanjing, the Yangshan Quarry stands as a monument to human ambition and ancient mystery. Here, amidst the dust and echoes of history, lies the colossal, unfinished stele, intended to honor a Ming dynasty emperor. Why would humans embark on such a grand project, knowing the immense challenge of moving it, and then mysteriously abandon it? If you wish to pass information to a distant future, if you wish it to be preserved, you wouldn't be smart to just write it down. This mystery not only captivates the imagination, but also invites us to explore the profound complexities of engineering, royal ambition, and perhaps the supernatural influences that shape our endeavors. The Yangshan Quarry is an archaeological site of great historical importance, mainly due to its ambitious yet unfinished project initiated by the Yongle Emperor. This project aimed to create a colossal stele to commemorate his father, the Hongwu Emperor, the founder of the Ming Dynasty. I think their project was to honor and memorialize it. Is knowledge preserved and passed down through the ages? Yes, I think it is. The Yongle Emperor, who reigned from 1402 to 1424, is celebrated for his significant architectural and cultural achievements, which included not only the construction of the Forbidden City, but also this immense stele project. This act was intended not merely as a show of familial respect, but also to legitimize his rule and link his achievements to those of the dynasty's founder, thus enhancing the continuity and legitimacy of his own reign. The construction of such a monument also served as a display of imperial power and the advanced capabilities of Ming dynasty engineering. That is one of the mistakes in looking for a quote-unquote advanced civilization in the past is that we tend to be looking for ourselves. From an architectural standpoint, the primary goal of the Yangshan Quarry was to extract stone of an unprecedented size and scale. The stele for the Hongwu Emperor was to be the largest of its kind ever created, a symbol of the immense power and enduring legacy of the Ming Dynasty. This ambitious project required vast resources and a workforce capable of overcoming the logistical challenges posed by the stone's enormous dimensions. In Imperial China, erecting steles was a deeply cultural act, often associated with honoring divine or royal entities. The project commissioned by the Yongle Emperor linked him with the divine mandate, ascribing almost celestial reverence to his ancestors and himself, thus reinforcing his rule as divinely sanctioned. The design and craftsmanship of the stele were planned to be magnificent. The project was to be composed of three grand pieces. The base, intended to support the enormous weight of the stele and act as both a physical and symbolic foundation. The body, which was to be intricately engraved with inscriptions praising the Hongwu Emperor and detailing his accomplishments and virtues. And the crown, planned to be elaborately decorated with dragon motifs or other imperial symbols, signifying the celestial authority of the Emperor. The dimensions of the stele were also staggering. The body of the stele itself was planned to exceed 30 meters in length, 13 meters wide and 10 meters thick. Weighing approximately 16,250 metric tons, this stone would have been one of the largest ever carved by human hands, comparable in weight to about 2,500 adult African elephants. To appreciate the scale further, the length of the stele's body was almost as long as the wingspan of a Boeing 747 airplane, underscoring not only its immense size, but also the bold engineering ambitions of the Ming Dynasty, mirroring the monumental constructions of other ancient civilizations like the Egyptians and Romans. But remember that the ancient Egyptians tell us, in many of their texts, that everything they knew was a legacy. legacy. The ambitious project at Yangshan Quarry, designed to immortalize the Yongle Emperor's father, faced insurmountable challenges after the Emperor's death. The primary issue was the logistical nightmare of transporting the immense stone 10 kilometers to the Ming Shaoling Mausoleum. Despite having a large labor force and advanced engineering techniques of the era, the task proved beyond the capabilities of the period's transportation technologies, leading to the project's abandonment. In the course of studying the quarry, 
Archaeologists have unearthed a diverse arsenal of traditional tools that were used to work these massive stones. Chisels, hammers and levers crafted from iron were employed in a meticulously organized manner to extract and precisely shape the gargantuan stones. The innovative methods employed by the workers were particularly ingenious. One such method, known as fire setting, involved heating the rock surface with fire and then dousing it with cold water. This sudden temperature change caused the rock to undergo thermal shock, resulting in cracks that made it easier to shape and remove the stone. The layout of the Yangshan Quarry also provides insights into the organization of labor and resources during that time. Large teams of workers were coordinated in a highly structured approach, possibly under the direct supervision of imperial engineers. This meticulous organization was essential for executing such a monumental project, demonstrating the sophisticated management practices of the Ming dynasty in handling large-scale constructions. This coordination not only facilitated the quarrying process but also ensured that each phase of the work was completed as efficiently as possible, despite the eventual abandonment of the project due to logistical challenges. While the organizational prowess at Yangshan Quarry was impressive, the technological innovations possibly used there truly showcase the brilliance of ancient Chinese engineering. The enormous stones at the quarry, some of the largest ever quarried in human history, display a level of precision in cutting and shaping that suggests the use of extremely advanced techniques. Historians and archaeologists have long speculated that the ancient Chinese engineers might have utilized now lost techniques that facilitated their monumental tasks. These could have included specialized cutting tools, measurement systems for exact angles and flat surfaces, and unique methods for splitting stone from rock beds without causing it to crack entirely. The precision with which these stones were quarried and shaped suggests a sophisticated integration of various fields of knowledge, including geometry, physics, and materials science, indicating a highly developed technological culture. I believe that it's worth considering the possibility of a remote common ancestor which passed down key information that was inherited by later cultures. Drawing parallels with Roman engineering, we see that Roman engineers also revolutionized construction with the development of hydraulic cement and the extensive use of arches, vaults and domes, which allowed them to build enduring structures like the Pantheon and the aqueducts. They were masters at utilizing available resources and adapting their engineering solutions to the diverse conditions of their vast empire. Similarly, the engineers at Yangshan may have developed their own unique methods to manage the quarrying of such massive stones. This might have involved the use of intricate lever systems designed to maximize mechanical advantage, or even early forms of cranes which could have been powered by large human teams or possibly by animals. Both civilizations demonstrated an understanding of leverage and load distribution. For instance, Roman cranes and capstans were used for lifting heavy weights, while similar principles could have been applied in Yangshan for moving large stone blocks. Additional techniques hypothesized to be used at Yangshan include the strategic use of water to aid in the transport of these massive stones. By creating a series of canals and using buoyancy, the engineers could have significantly reduced the effective weight of the stones, making them easier to maneuver over large distances. Seasonal adjustments might also have played a role in the timing of the quarry work. Engineers might have taken advantage of frozen ground during the winter to move heavy stones more easily, a technique evidenced in other historical contexts such as the transport of large stones for the construction of medieval cathedrals in Europe. Moreover, the durability and flexibility of bamboo, widely available in China, would have made it particularly useful for creating temporary frameworks and scaffolding, demonstrating the ingenious solutions employed to tackle the challenges of such a monumental project. While exploring the technological aspects of the Yangshan Quarry project is fascinating, the supernatural narratives surrounding its abandonment offer an equally intriguing dimension. In traditional Chinese culture, the spiritual world is deeply intertwined with the physical realm, and many construction projects from ancient times are wrapped in tales of omens and divine messages. Local legends from Yangshan suggest that the massive Stele project was halted by supernatural forces. These stories recount strange and ominous signs that appeared during the quarrying process, which local workers and officials interpreted as warnings from the heavens. These warnings supposedly dissuaded them from continuing the project for fear of invoking disaster or bad luck. 
Such tales might be more than mere superstitions. They could represent symbolic expressions of the workers' fears and the practical difficulties they faced, projected onto supernatural explanations. Japan is a megalithic culture. Many of the megaliths in Japan have never really been properly studied. This doesn't happen naturally. This is a man-made structure. Unless there's any doubt that it's man-made, let's get up close and look at it. It's made of individual blocks of stone. Having gone to all the work of creating huge megaliths like this, they wouldn't have wasted them. Imagine standing before a vast network of subterranean caverns, extending thousands of square meters deep into the earth, carved from the unique volcanic tuff known as Oya Stone. When these caverns at the Oya Stone Quarry in Utsunomiya were first created, it seemed nearly impossible for humans of that era to shape such an immense and complex structure, yet somehow they did, with nothing more than rudimentary tools and sheer human effort. I want to know what else is going to be found that hasn't been investigated yet at all. We're just touching the edge of a huge mystery. Did this really happen, or was there more at play here than meets the eye? Fast forward to today, and despite our advanced technology and engineering prowess, replicating such a feat remains a formidable challenge. This marvel of both natural formation and human endeavor invites us to explore its depths, uncovering the secrets held within its echoing chambers and imposing walls. I think we're confronted by an enormous mystery with megalithic sites all around the world, uh, and we don't understand them properly. The Oya Stone Quarry, with its deep historical roots in Japan's architectural landscape, offers a fascinating glimpse into the evolution from localized resource extraction to significant industrial use. The exact discovery date of the quarry isn't well documented, but evidence suggests that small-scale extraction of Oya Stone began around the Heian period. I think the dating of quite a number of megalithic sites needs to be reconsidered. It quickly became popular for its unique properties, particularly its ease of carving when freshly quarried, which made it ideal for constructing religious structures like temples and shrines, as well as for creating detailed statues for these sites. As we move into the Edo period, the role of Oya stone expanded dramatically. This was a time of relative peace under the Tokugawa shogunate, marked by urbanization and the burgeoning need for more durable building materials. Oya stone, known for its enhanced fire resistance, became a critical resource in constructing robust, fire-resistant walls, particularly in Edo, modern-day Tokyo, which was prone to frequent fires. Wildfires are what you expect when you have a bit of a comet air bursting uh, up above you. The quarry's activities intensified with technological advancements in mining, such as the introduction of better chiseling tools and more systematic methods for removing large stone blocks. The expansion of cities during this period necessitated large quantities of durable materials, and Oya stone was extensively used not just for building walls, but also for bridges and other infrastructure projects that required materials that could withstand both the elements and the threat of fire. As demand surged, the shogunate implemented stricter regulations to manage the quarry operations effectively, ensuring the extraction rates were sustainable and that the stone remained available for future generations. When we compare Oya stone with European limestone, which was used for similar purposes, we notice both materials share the property of hardening over time, which is ideal for constructions meant to endure. However, while limestone in Europe was often chosen for both its practical and aesthetic qualities, Oya stone's use in Japan was deeply intertwined with the country's cultural and religious practices, reflecting a unique blend of utilitarian and spiritual values. This distinction highlights not only the functional importance of Oya stone, but also its role in shaping the cultural heritage of Japan. The Oya stone quarry is celebrated for its production of Oya stone, a unique type of green tough volcanic rock. Known for its distinctive qualities, this stone has been a cornerstone in Japanese architecture and art for centuries. Let's dive deep into its rich historical tapestry and uncover some fascinating details along with a compelling theory. Tracing back to around 800 AD during the early Heian period, the operations at the Oya stone quarry began in an era marked by the consolidation of power in the Japanese imperial court and a cultural boom influenced heavily by the Chinese Tang dynasty aesthetics. Initially, Oya stone was primarily used for constructing the foundations and lower structures of buildings in local villages, largely because of its accessibility and the ease with which it could be carved when freshly quarried. 
What makes Oya stone particularly intriguing is its unique physical property. It is relatively soft when first quarried, but hardens upon exposure to air. This feature allowed ancient builders to initially carve it with ease, and as it hardened it would transform into a durable structural element. Not only did its warm beige to light grey hues and porous texture enhance the natural aesthetics of traditional Japanese buildings, but it also provided excellent insulation properties. As the Heian period progressed, the cultural center of Japan shifted to Kyoto, increasing the architectural demand for Oya stone, possibly spurred by its fire-resistant properties, an essential feature in an era prone to wooden structure fires. By the late Heian period, the stone's reach extended beyond local regions, finding its way into more significant and prestigious construction projects across Japan, such as temples, shrines, and statues. I can't help thinking time capsule that there was an intention to preserve this. Ancient texts often highlight its use in substantial state-sponsored construction projects, suggesting a growing importance in the architectural landscape of the time. The rising demand for Oya stone led to a significant expansion of the quarry operations. Quarrying techniques evolved from simple manual methods to more organized mining activities involving larger labor forces. This expansion not only catered to the increasing architectural demands, but also became a focal point for local economic development, providing numerous jobs and contributing to the growth of surrounding communities. An intriguing theory about the Oya stone quarry is that it was discovered and initially developed under the auspices of the Imperial Family of Japan. This theory suggests that the Imperial Family might have used the quarry to demonstrate their divine right to rule by constructing temples and palaces with this unique stone. Ancient cultures all around the world preserved a memory of a high civilization. The frequent use of Oya stone in imperial and noble projects during the Heian period supports this theory. The distinctiveness of the stone and the grandeur it imparted to buildings would have symbolized the celestial and exalted status of the emperor, aligning perfectly with the imperial ambitions of the time. This fascinating hypothesis adds an additional layer of historical and cultural significance to the already rich narrative of the Oya stone quarry. Nestled in Utsunomiya, Tochigi Prefecture, the Oya Stone Quarry offers more than just a peek into the world of mining. It presents a fascinating interplay of geology, history, and acoustics. Let's delve into the intriguing details of its underground caverns, their extensive history, and unique characteristics. Spanning an impressive 20,000 square meters, these caverns form a vast subterranean network that has been shaped over centuries. In some areas, they plunge as deep as 60 meters, equivalent to a 20-story building. This vast and varied landscape not only offers a glimpse into the Earth's depths, but also tells the tale of its past through the very walls that form it. Etched with the marks of pickaxes and chisels, the cavern walls narrate the history of mining techniques that evolved through the ages. Occasionally, miners have left behind tools and artifacts, which have been preserved and are now part of the quarry's historical tapestry. The caverns also display an array of natural and man-made formations, from varied color strains and vein patterns to different mineral compositions, each adding a layer to the story of the region's geological history. Beyond their historical and visual appeal, these caverns are known for their exceptional acoustic properties. The porosity and density of the Oya stone allow for sound to be absorbed and dampened, creating an environment with minimal echo and clear sound quality. Drawing a comparison to the ancient underground cities of Cappadocia in Turkey, both carved directly into volcanic rock, highlights interesting contrasts. While Oya's caverns were primarily used industrially for mining, Cappadocia's were designed for habitation and protection, equipped with living quarters, churches, and even ventilation shafts. An intriguing theory about the Oya stone quarry suggests that its extensive network and depth could have offered strategic military advantages during historical conflicts. The caverns, with their complexity and depth, might have served as excellent hiding spots or secret passages, a theory supported by Japan's historical use of landscape features in military strategy. Moreover, the Oya stone quarry has caught the eye of the film and television industry due to its dramatic and otherworldly ambience. For instance, Martin Scorsese's silence used the haunting backdrop of the caverns to portray the rugged landscapes of 17th-century Japan, enhancing the grim atmosphere of the story. 
While not actually filmed at the quarry, the scenes within the fortress-like environments of Inception evoke a similar monumental scale and maze-like interiors that one can associate with the Oya Stone Quarry's vast network. But what about this bizarre enclosure wall that surrounds it? Each of these three blocks weighs 900 tons. And it's extraordinary the way they're built into a wall and raised 30 feet above the ground like this. A wall, the provenance for which has not been established by archaeology. Deep within the dense forests of New Zealand's North Island lies the Kaimanawa Wall, a structure shrouded in mystery and controversy. With its precisely aligned blocks that mimic the handiwork of an ancient stonemason, this wall challenges the conventional timeline of human history in New Zealand. Could this be the remnants of a lost civilization, or simply an incredible feat of natural geology? Or was there another creator of these walls we don't know about? As debates continue and theories abound, the Kaimanawa Wall invites explorers and scholars alike to delve into its mysterious presence, potentially rewriting history with each new discovery. In the 1990s, an unexpected discovery by helicopter pilot Barry Brailsford dramatically shifted the focus of historical and archaeological exploration in New Zealand. While flying over the dense, rugged terrain of the Kaimanawa Ranges in the central part of the North Island, Brailsford spotted an unusual formation. From his aerial vantage point, this formation was clearly visible as a series of large, neatly arranged stone blocks. Their unusual and striking regularity, characterized by straight lines and precise angles, made them stand out distinctly from the natural ruggedness of the surrounding landscape. This area of the Kaimanawa Forest Park is quite remote and not easily accessible on foot, which likely explains why the formation had remained unnoticed by ground-based observers. Recognizing the potential significance of his find, Brailsford took decisive steps to ensure that both the public and the scientific community became aware of the formation. He began by capturing photographs of the wall. These images were crucial for documenting its characteristics and facilitating the initial assessments by geologists and archaeologists. Understanding the broader implications, Brailsford also reached out to local media outlets sharing his findings and the intriguing images of the wall. This proactive engagement with the media was instrumental in sparking widespread interest and debate about the nature and origins of the wall, bringing it into the public eye and making it a subject of fascination and controversy in equal measure. The Kaimanawa wall and its peculiar features bear a striking resemblance to ancient megalithic structures, sparking a lively debate about its origins. Whether it's a product of natural geological processes or an artifact of an ancient civilization. The wall is remarkable for its orderly assembly of large rhyolite blocks. These stones are not only uniform in size, but also exhibit geometric precision with their straight edges and sharp angles, characteristics that are uncommon in natural rock formations, which typically show more random and varied profiles. The wall stretches approximately 30 meters in length and stands about 2 meters high. Each block is nearly identical in size, which varies slightly, but stays within a narrow range, suggesting a level of precision that is either a remarkable act of nature or evidence of human craftsmanship. To understand more about this mysterious structure, detailed geological surveys have been conducted at the site. These involve analyzing rock samples and the structural composition of the wall to determine the type of rock, its age, and the possible geological processes that could have led to such a structured appearance. The findings reveal that the wall is composed of rhyolite, a volcanic rock prevalent in the Taupo volcanic zone. Rhyolite can fracture naturally in straight lines, particularly under conditions where the lava cools uniformly and slowly. The uniform and angular disposition of the blocks at the Kaimanawa wall is consistent with certain types of natural stone fracturing processes, known in geology as jointing, which can create angular and straight fractures. Most geological assessments classify the Kaimanawa wall as a natural formation, primarily because of the natural occurrence of columnar jointing in volcanic rocks, similar to rhyolite. This process can result in formations with surprising geometric regularity, akin to those found in well-known sites like the Giant's Causeway. The debate continues, however, as these compelling comparisons and scientific analyses deepen the mystery, 
leaving room for different interpretations and ongoing research into this megalithic structure. The Giant's Causeway, nestled on the northeast coast of Northern Ireland, serves as a stunning natural wonder of the world and provides an interesting point of comparison to the mysterious structures of New Zealand's Kaimanawa Wall. Renowned for its roughly 40,000 interlocking basalt columns, the Giant's Causeway was formed about 50 to 60 million years ago during the Paleogene period. This unique formation occurred when a volcanic eruption caused highly fluid lava to spread across a large area. As this lava cooled, it contracted significantly, particularly at the surface which cooled more rapidly. This contraction led to the formation of vertical cracks that ultimately shaped the distinctive hexagonal columns that are so characteristic of the causeway. Interestingly, while most of these columns are hexagonal, they can have anywhere from four to eight sides. The columns vary in height, with the tallest reaching about 12 meters and diameters ranging from 15 to 25 centimeters. Beyond its geological significance, the Giant's Causeway is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, celebrated for its natural beauty and its contribution to geological research. This site is particularly valued for its classic example of columnar jointing, offering vital insights into volcanic cooling processes. It acts as a crucial natural laboratory for geologists who study these phenomena and has played a pivotal role in confirming theories regarding the cooling rates and contraction forces of basaltic lava. The site is also deeply embedded in local mythology and folklore, most notably through the legend of Finn McCool, an Irish giant. According to legend, Finn built the causeway to reach Scotland and confront another giant. When he saw the immense size of his opponent, Finn retreated. His wife then cleverly disguised him as a baby, tricking the Scottish giant into believing that if the child was so large, the father must be truly colossal. Frightened by this prospect, the Scottish giant fled, destroying the causeway behind him to prevent pursuit. Turning to the Kaimanawa Wall, while it shares the feature of symmetrical stone patterns with the giant's causeway, its origin sparks more debate. The discussion oscillates between natural geological processes and possible human construction, unlike the clearly natural origins of the Giant's Causeway. This situation highlights how similar geological phenomena can manifest under vastly different conditions and interpretations, showcasing the complexities and wonders of Earth's geological diversity. This comparison between two such diverse geological formations underlines the intricate ways in which natural forces and, potentially, human influences intertwine to shape our understanding of the world's ancient landscapes. Another reason to believe the Kaimanawa Wall in New Zealand could have been man-made is by looking at the Inca Walls in Peru. They both represent two fascinating yet starkly different types of stone constructions, each with their own unique characteristics construction techniques and surrounding theories. The Inca walls, notably at sites like Sacsayhuaman and Ollantaytambo near Cusco, demonstrate an exceptional level of craftsmanship in stone masonry. The Incas utilized a technique known as ashlar masonry, where large stones are meticulously cut to fit together tightly without any mortar. The precision of this stone cutting is so remarkable that not even a blade of grass can fit between the stones. This technique not only provided structural stability but also enhanced the wall's resistance to earthquakes, a common threat in the Andean region. These walls are not just functional, they hold significant cultural importance, reflecting the Incas' sophisticated understanding of architecture and their deep connection to their environment. The alignments of the walls with celestial events like solstices and equinoxes underscore their importance in Inca religion and agricultural practices. The precise methods used by the Incas to shape these stones remain a subject of debate among archaeologists. Some theories suggest the use of tools made from harder stones or bronze, while others propose techniques that involved heating the stones and then rapidly cooling them with water to create fractures. In contrast, the origin of New Zealand's Kaimanawa Wall is shrouded in debate. While some suggest it might be a natural geological formation resulting from the regular fracturing of volcanic rock, specifically rhyolite under certain cooling conditions, others speculate about its potential as a man-made structure. A key point in this debate is the absence of tool marks, which are clearly visible on the Inca walls. This supports the theory that the Kaimanawa wall's formation might be natural rather than crafted by human hands. 
the unusual regularity and symmetry of the stones at the Kaimanawa wall, while rare in natural formations, are not deemed impossible by geologists. Similar formations have been noted in other parts of the world where columnar basalt or other fracturing patterns have occurred due to volcanic activity. The Inca walls are undeniably the result of intentional skilled labor, showcasing advanced techniques in stone cutting and construction. In contrast, the Kaimanawa wall, if a product of natural geological processes, represents an intriguing example of how natural forces can mimic the appearance of intentional construction. While the Inca walls were integral to the social and religious fabric of their creators, built to last and to impress both the gods and future generations, the Kaimanawa wall's significance lies primarily in the mystery of its origins, whether it is a remarkable natural geological artifact or evidence of a forgotten civilization. The Kaimanawa wall, if confirmed to be man-made origins, could radically reshape our understanding of New Zealand's prehistoric past. This enigmatic structure could suggest the presence of an advanced pre-Maori civilization, challenging the currently accepted timeline of human settlement in the region. Such a revelation has significant implications, not just for archaeologists and historians, but for the entire narrative of New Zealand's history. Over time, the wall has woven itself into the fabric of local lore and speculative histories. Various non-mainstream historians and enthusiasts have suggested that it might be evidence of ancient settlers or even lost civilizations. This is similar to the speculative interpretations that surround other mysterious ancient structures found worldwide, where local myths and global intrigue often blend to form compelling tales of forgotten histories. The ongoing interest in the Kaimanawa Wall exemplifies a broader global fascination with unexplained structures. It continues to be a focal point for discussions about archaeological methodologies and the interpretation of ancient sites. This mystery invites a deeper dive into the past, prompting calls from within the scientific community for more comprehensive studies to ascertain the true nature of the wall. Such investigations are crucial, as they not only help clarify the origins of specific structures but also enhance our understanding of the human footprint across different epochs and geographies. Some 13,000 years ago, a group of people from Asia walked across a land bridge that connected Siberia to Alaska and headed south. It was long held that there was only one founding population and that their route was up through Siberia. The first settlers made it to the Americas. Deep in the remote forests of Siberia lie the Gornaya Shoria megaliths, colossal granite blocks so vast and precisely aligned that they dwarf even the great stones of the Egyptian pyramids. But remember that the ancient Egyptians tell us in many of their texts that everything they knew was a legacy. A legacy. With some weighing in at an astounding 3,000 to 4,000 tons, these structures pose a tantalizing question. If our modern machinery would struggle to maneuver such massive stones today, how could ancient humans have possibly constructed them? Let's consider what we mean by advanced. What is, it? What is an advanced civilization? Are we really an advanced civilization? This mystery invites us to explore not only the breathtaking scale of these megaliths, but also the advanced yet unknown technologies that might have been used in an era long past. That is one of the mistakes in looking for a quote-unquote advanced civilization in the past, is that we tend to be looking for ourselves. The Gornaya Shoria megaliths, sometimes referred to as the Shoria megaliths, are a series of massive and mysterious stone structures located in the southern Siberian region of Kemerovo province. This part of Siberia, known for its rugged and forested landscape, forms a continuation of the mountainous belt that includes the famous Altai Mountains, stretching into Kazakhstan, Mongolia and China. The harsh Siberian climate, marked by severe winters and brief summers, coupled with the mountainous and densely forested terrain, makes archaeological expeditions to this area particularly challenging. The huge areas of the earth where only minimal archaeological investigations have ever been carried out. I get it, it's a very tough place to work. And besides, archaeology has the view that there's not much to find there. The megaliths didn't attract significant academic attention until the 21st century, despite earlier mentions by local historians and enthusiasts during the Soviet era. The shift in interest came largely due to the increased availability of information online, 
and the efforts of local explorers like John Jensen and Dr. Valery Uvarov. I recognize some patterns that appear to be man-made or at least non-natural. Their publications and photographs, which highlighted the scale and precision of the megaliths, spurred wider interest and debate, although the area remains underexplored in formal archaeological terms. The physical attributes of the Gornaya Shuria megaliths are particularly striking, dwarfing even the largest stones used in the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which weigh around 80 tons. The precision with which these stones are cut and aligned, exhibiting flat surfaces, sharp angles and tightly fitting joints without mortar, suggests an advanced level of engineering skill. This craftsmanship is reminiscent of the famous Inca walls in Cusco, Peru, where similarly interlocking stones have withstood centuries of seismic activity. A comparison is often drawn with the walls of Sacsayhuaman in Cusco, Peru, another site known for its high-precision stonework. Incredible megaliths there, which archaeology gives entirely to the Incas. Even though the Incas themselves recognized and honored the work of predecessors. Both the Gonaya Shoria and Sacsayhuaman sites display an extraordinary level of stonework that challenges our understanding of ancient engineering capabilities. However, the sheer size of the stones at Gonaya Shoria makes the site even more perplexing, raising intriguing questions about the logistics of stone transport and manipulation by ancient builders. The Gonaya Shoria megaliths have captured the imagination of many, but they also offer a fascinating case study for geologists who propose that these giant formations could be entirely natural. Various geological processes, particularly those involving glaciers and tectonic activities, might explain their formation without needing to invoke theories of human or extraterrestrial involvement. During the last ice age, massive glaciers moved across landscapes, carrying large boulders known as erratics far from their original quarries. As these glaciers retreated, they left behind these huge stones. Additionally, as the ice moved, it could polish and create striated marks on the surfaces of these rocks, contributing to the smooth and flat appearances that some of the Shoria megaliths exhibit. This is not uncommon in other parts of the world where glacial activities have shaped the terrain. Beyond glaciation, the processes of weathering play a significant role. Chemical weathering, where the rock interacts with the environment, can dissolve weaker materials in the stone, leaving behind angular blocks that might appear artificially carved. Meanwhile, the freeze-thaw cycles typical of Siberia's harsh climate cause the rocks to crack and break naturally along lines of weakness forming the angular structures observed today. The region's intense seismic activity also contributes to the megalith's mysterious shapes. The area is prone to movements in the earth that can fracture bedrock, creating sharp angular formations that mimic the appearance of quarried stone. These natural fractures caused by faulting and the pressure of tectonic forces suggest a plausible explanation for the megalith's geometric precision. As tectonic forces lift and fold rock layers, pressure release can also occur, leading to a process known as exfoliation. This causes the rock to break off in sheets or segments, forming large, flat slabs that might look like the work of human hands. An interesting parallel can be drawn with California's Devil's Postpile National Monument, known for its symmetrical, hexagonal columns of basalt formed by the slow cooling of a lava flow and subsequent contraction cracking. This site exemplifies how complex and regular structures can form through natural geological processes, demonstrating that the precise and orderly structures we see at Gornaya Shoria could also be the product of dynamic earth processes. Not only have the, the Gornaya Shoria megaliths captured the interests of geologists, but also ignited a flurry of archaeological theories. Some researchers propose that these vast stone structures are the product of an advanced yet unknown ancient civilization. This theory is supported by the megalith's precise cuts and alignments, which imply the use of sophisticated stoneworking technologies that surpass those known from other ancient cultures of the same era. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. These observations lead some to speculate about possible cultural and technological exchanges between distant civilizations, suggesting that the builders of the Gornaya Shoria megaliths could have been part of a widespread network. This network might have facilitated the spread of architectural and engineering skills across vast distances, much like how architectural styles were shared along the Silk Road. 
In addition to these mainstream archaeological views, there are several alternative theories that touch on more unconventional narratives. One such theory suggests that extraterrestrial beings could have influenced the creation of the megaliths. Proponents of this idea argue that the scale and precision of the stonework exceed what would have been technologically feasible for humans at the time, drawing parallels to other mysterious ancient sites like the Nazca Lines in Peru, which feature designs that are best viewed from the air. Another intriguing hypothesis posits that these megaliths were the work of a now-lost civilization that had access to advanced technologies for manipulating stone, construction, and possibly even geolocation. Technologies that were superior to those of known ancient cultures and which could have been lost following a cataclysmic event like a massive flood or volcanic eruption, reminiscent of the legendary Atlantis. A comparison with the Baalbek Temple Complex in Lebanon, particularly the Trilithon, offers further context. The Trilithon features three massive stones, each weighing between 800 to 1,000 tons, meticulously placed upon rows of smaller blocks. This is called the Trilithon. Each of these three blocks weighs 900 tons. The similarities in scale and construction techniques between Baalbek and Gornaya Shoria raise additional questions about the ancient capabilities in quarrying, transporting and assembling such enormous stones. Just as the precise alignment of the blocks at Gornaya Shoria suggests advanced engineering skills, the Baalbek stones are also fitted with such precision that not even a piece of paper can slide between them. This remarkable precision across both sites suggests a sophisticated understanding of stonework that challenges our perceptions of ancient engineering. The Gornaya Shoria megaliths pose significant challenges for researchers and archaeologists attempting to uncover their secrets. The region is famously difficult to access, characterized by dense forests and mountainous landscapes that are tough to navigate. The climate further complicates research efforts, with harsh winters that bring heavy snowfall and freezing temperatures, limiting fieldwork to the brief Siberian summer months. The nearby settlements offer limited resources, making it challenging to support sustained scientific activities. Accommodations, roads and communication facilities are all less developed, which is essential for conducting large-scale archaeological excavations. This lack of local support, combined with a general prioritization of resources towards more well-known sites, means that Gornaya Shoria often remains overlooked in broader archaeological explorations. As society got more advanced in this time, yeah. it seems we have less and less dependence on astronomy. Why would astronomy play as big of a role in them where everything is pointing to X, Y, and Z stars? Well, first of all, let's, con let's consider what we mean by advanced. What is, what is an advanced civilization? Are we really an advanced civilization? That is one of the mistakes in looking for a quote-unquote advanced civilization in the past, is that we tend to be looking for ourselves. Nestled in the verdant landscape of County Meath, Ireland, Newgrange stands as one of Europe's most enigmatic prehistoric monuments. This ancient passage tomb, part of the larger Bruna Buan complex, is renowned for its precise alignment with the winter solstice sunrise. On the summer solstice, you're going to see the sun rising far to the north of east. Go there on the winter solstice, you're going to see it far to the south of east. Constructed over 5,000 years ago, Newgrange has captivated scholars and visitors with its mysterious origins, intricate megalithic art, and its dual role as a ceremonial site and burial place. Its discovery and study have peeled back the layers of Neolithic society, revealing their engineering prowess and deep spiritual and astronomical understandings. And that's why, why we get the astrological ages. Again, mainstream science sneers at these things. Interestingly, while Newgrange was known to the local population of the Boyne Valley, it didn't capture the attention of scholars and historians until much later. To think that somebody was here 5,000 years ago, I think it must be as close to immortality as you could hope to get to. The journey of rediscovering Newgrange began before the scholarly world took an interest, when it was merely part of the local folklore and agricultural landscape. It wasn't until the late 17th century that it started to draw scholarly eyes, notably through the works of Sir William Wilde in the 19th century. Wilde, better known as the father of playwright Oscar Wilde, was an accomplished antiquarian who documented various archaeological sites across Ireland. His works laid the groundwork for future explorations, 
though the most pivotal moment for Newgrange came in 1699 during an everyday activity, road construction. A lot of archaeology that gets done doesn't get done because of a targeted search. It may be because a dam is being built or a new highway is being built. The landowner, Charles Campbell, needing stones for building a road, directed his workers to the large mound on his property. As they dug into the mound, they unexpectedly broke through to a main passageway, unveiling the entrance to what they would soon realize was an ancient passage tomb. This accidental breakthrough led the workers to explore the inner chambers and passageways, where they discovered human bones and possible grave goods, suggesting that the site was used as a burial ground. These initial, albeit informal, excavations began to reveal the megalithic art and the structural complexity that Newgrange housed. I can't help thinking, time capsule, that there was an intention to preserve this. Recognizing the potential importance of the site, Campbell made initial records of the discoveries. However, these records were quite rudimentary and didn't capture the full archaeological value of the site. As word spread, Newgrange began attracting visitors and curiosity seekers by the early 18th century, turning it into an early form of a tourist attraction. These early tourists left behind accounts that provide a valuable perspective on the site's condition and the public perception over the centuries. The rekindled interest in Newgrange had a significant impact on the study of Neolithic Ireland, leading to more systematic studies and eventually to the extensive excavations carried out by Michael J. O'Kelly in the 20th century. First of all, Professor, how did this great big stone and so many of them get up here? Many of these big stones were lying about on the land surface since the end of the Ice Age. An interesting comparison can be drawn between the rediscovery of Newgrange and the uncovering of Pompeii in 1748, where workers constructing a palace for the King of Naples accidentally stumbled upon the remains of the city, buried since 79 AD by volcanic ash from Mount Vesuvius. Both discoveries made during routine construction opened windows into ancient civilizations, offering unprecedented insights into their daily lives, spiritual beliefs and practices. However, while Pompeii provides a snapshot frozen in time, Newgrange offers a glimpse into a far older, less understood epoch spanning several millennia, bridging our modern world with the deep past of ancient societies. As we delve deeper into the mysteries of Newgrange, it's clear that this ancient site holds more than just historical significance. It serves as a testament to the evolutionary journey of archaeological interpretation itself, Beginning in the 19th century, Newgrange started to capture the scientific imagination thanks to its enigmatic allure and the intricate carvings adorning its stones. Early archaeologists and antiquarians meticulously documented the site, establishing a detailed record of its dimensions, carvings and overall structure. These foundational studies were pivotal in beginning to understand the complex nature of this prehistoric monument. Initially classified as a passage tomb in the early 20th century, a typical Neolithic structure characterized by a circular mound with a long, narrow passage leading to a central chamber, Newgrange aligned well with other similar European structures based on its architectural features and the human remains discovered within. However, modern interpretations have suggested a broader role for Newgrange, hinting at its function as a ceremonial or ritual site due to its elaborate construction, astronomical alignments, and extensive use of symbolic artwork. This suggests that Newgrange might have served multiple communal purposes throughout the centuries, far beyond its initial categorization as merely a burial place. The mid-20th century brought about a transformation in our understanding of Newgrange, spearheaded by Professor Michael J. O'Kelly's groundbreaking excavations from 1962 to 1975. We have a, a quite new and intriguing problem to solve. Perhaps next year when we can excavate farther into the mound. His extensive and scientifically rigorous work systematically revealed the structural integrity and design of the site, showing how the Neolithic builders expertly constructed the mound and its internal passages. Among his most notable discoveries was the winter solstice illumination, a phenomenon where the sunrise on the shortest day of the year illuminates the main passage and chamber through a specially designed roof box. This discovery confirmed that Newgrange was precisely aligned with astronomical events, indicating a sophisticated understanding of solar movements by its builders. 
However, O'Kelly's restoration efforts, particularly the reconstruction of the white quartz facade, stirred both acclaim and controversy. While these efforts aimed to protect and stabilize the structure, some critics argued that they might not truly reflect the site's original appearance. Despite these debates, O'Kelly's work has been crucial in preserving Newgrange for future generations and maintaining its status as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. An interesting theory that has emerged about Newgrange is its potential role in shamanic practices. That advanced civilization emerged out of shamanism itself. Some scholars suggest that the intricate carvings inside the tomb, especially the spirals and other geometric motifs, could represent shamanic visions or cosmological maps. Shamans are very observant of the cosmos and of what is going on in the cosmos. According to this theory, Newgrange might have served as a sacred space where shamans entered trance states, with the winter solstice light acting as a catalyst for celestial journeys or communication with the ancestral spirits. The site features a unique architectural element known as the roof box, ingeniously designed to allow sunlight to penetrate the passage at sunrise on the shortest day of the year. This small aperture is strategically positioned to catch the first rays of the sun as it rises, illuminating the inner chamber in a breathtaking display of ancient precision. The significance of this event extends beyond its architectural marvel. It lasts approximately 17 minutes and is believed to have held profound ceremonial importance for the Neolithic community. Scholars suggest that this phenomenon might have symbolized the rebirth of the sun, heralding a new year and promising renewal for the community. It likely served as a moment of social and religious reawakening, reinforcing the community's connection with the cosmos and marking a time of celebration and reverence. Today, the allure of Newgrange during the winter solstice continues to draw crowds from around the globe. A lottery system is now in place to manage the number of visitors who wish to experience the solstice from inside the chamber, highlighting the enduring spiritual significance of this ancient observance. The experience offers a unique glimpse into the past, allowing modern visitors to connect with the astronomical achievements of an ancient civilization. Notably, human bones found within the chambers suggest that Newgrange was used as a burial site, though not uniformly across all chambers. This selective usage adds to the mystery of Newgrange, indicating it may have served multiple functions, possibly as a final resting place for important members of the community. Drawing a parallel with another marvel of ancient engineering, the Egyptian pyramids, particularly the Great Pyramid of Giza, we see a similar integration of astronomical knowledge into architectural design. Like Newgrange, the Great Pyramid is precisely aligned with celestial events, thought to have been oriented with the pole star of the time, Polaris. This alignment not only underscores their function as tombs or temples, but also as calendars or astronomical observatories embedding the movements of the sun, moon, and stars into their structures. Both Newgrange and the Great Pyramid stand as testaments to the advanced astronomical understanding of their builders, bridging the earthly and the divine in their monumental designs. Very little is left of the ancient North American monuments. More than 90% of the structures that were documented in the 19th century are now completely gone. And of the less than 10% that remain, the majority have been vandalized and destroyed. destroyed. Discovering the ancient Maya civilization has been like piecing together a giant, fascinating puzzle. Picture this. Back in the 16th century, Spanish explorers led by folks like Hernán Cortés stumbled upon the remnants of a once glorious civilization, with towering cities now reclaimed by the jungle. Oh, the tragedy of the American, North American pyramids. There was once more than a million of them. Only a hundred thousand are left now. Sadly, their initial encounters weren't the most respectful. A lot of Maya history got lost or destroyed, thanks to biases and a general lack of understanding. The horrendous catastrophe of the Spanish conquest, the, the Spanish sent ahead of them terrible diseases like smallpox. Fast forward to the 19th century, and there's a renewed buzz about the Maya. This time, it's explorers and adventurers 
trekking through the jungles of Central America and the Yucatan Peninsula, hungry for knowledge about these ancient peoples. Two guys, John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, became the rock stars of Maya exploration. In the 1830s and 1840s, they journeyed to sites like Copan and Palenque, sketching and writing about their finds. Their work lit up the world's imagination with tales and visuals of the Maya's grand cities and sophisticated culture. By the 20th century, studying the Maya had become a serious scientific endeavor. Archaeologists got down and dirty in the ruins, conducting careful digs and uncovering secrets that the Maya left behind. Big projects at places like Copan and Chichen Itza peeled back layers of mystery, revealing intricate details about how the Maya lived, worshipped and governed themselves. If you have a relatively short time frame uh, to deal with, then searching for a lost civilization becomes much more complex and much more difficult. Discoveries at Tikal and Palenque gave us peeks into royal life with their elaborate tombs and stunning artwork, not to mention proof of the Maya's knack for architecture and stargazing. The lost city of El Mirador, hidden for centuries beneath the dense canopy of northern Guatemala's jungle, stands as a monumental witness to the ancient Maya civilization's grandeur and ingenuity. Rediscovered in the late 20th century, this city has profoundly reshaped our understanding of the Maya, pushing back the timeline of their architectural and societal achievements to much earlier than previously recognized. Flourishing from the 6th century BCE, El Mirador was a preeminent city in the Maya world during the pre-classic period, centuries before the rise of the more commonly known classical Maya cities such as Tikal and Palenque. Its scale and complexity are astonishing, with sprawling urban centers, elaborate plazas, and sophisticated water management systems, including reservoirs and canals, that supported a densely populated area at its zenith. The centerpiece of El Mirador is the colossal Ladanta Pyramid. Towering above the forest, Ladanta is not just the largest pyramid in the Maya world, but also one of the most massive ancient structures in the world by volume. The pyramid's base covers an area larger than nine football fields, and it rises to a height of approximately 230 feet. Constructing Ladanta would have required moving millions of cubic meters of earth and stone. A staggering feat given the absence of metal tools, the wheel, or domesticated beasts of burden. This monumental effort underscores the advanced engineering skills and social organization of the Maya, capable of mobilizing and sustaining such a large workforce. El Mirador's discovery also brought to light an extensive network of raised causeways, known as Sacbiob, connecting it with other cities and settlements across the region. These causeways facilitated trade, movement, and possibly acted as political and ceremonial pathways, illustrating the city's importance as a regional hub. One of the most intriguing theories about El Mirador, and the pre-classic Maya in general, concerns the reasons for the city's decline and eventual abandonment around the end of the first millennium BCE. Researchers speculate that extensive deforestation and the demands of large-scale agriculture may have led to environmental degradation, reducing the city's ability to support its population. This theory suggests a cautionary tale about the sustainability of human-environment interactions, echoing modern concerns about environmental management and conservation. Comparatively, El Mirador and its monumental architecture can be paralleled with ancient Egypt's Old Kingdom, which was contemporaneously constructing its own colossal structures, including the pyramids of Giza. Both civilizations achieved remarkable architectural feats without the advantages of modern technology, relying instead on a profound understanding of engineering, astronomy, and mathematics. However, Whereas Egypt's pyramids served primarily as tombs for pharaohs, Maya pyramids, like Ladanta, were multifunctional, serving as temples and possibly observatories, reflecting the Maya's integrated approach to religion, governance and science. The decipherment of the Maya script stands as one of the most enthralling detective stories in the history of archaeology and linguistics. For centuries, 
the intricate hieroglyphs carved into stone monuments, painted on pottery, and written in the few surviving bark paper books remained a locked treasure trove of the ancient Maya civilization's wisdom. The breakthrough in the 20th century, primarily attributed to the insights of Russian linguist Yuri Knorozov, transformed our understanding of the Maya, unveiling a civilization rich in history, culture, and scientific knowledge. The Maya script is a complex system of glyphs, which had stumped scholars for years. Early attempts at decipherment were hampered by the assumption that the script was purely ideographic, representing ideas rather than sounds, much like the Egyptian hieroglyphs before their decipherment. This led to numerous speculative and often incorrect interpretations of Maya texts. The turning point came in the 1950s with Yuri Gnorozov. He proposed that the glyphs were not only logographic, but also phonetic, representing sounds. Knorozov's insight was based on the use of the Landa alphabet, a set of glyphs recorded by Spanish bishop Diego de Landa, which had been dismissed by many as inaccurate. Knorozov suggested that these glyphs could represent phonetic sounds as well as logographic symbols. This approach opened the door to reading the Maya script as a fully functional writing system that included phonetic elements. Nurozov's work sparked a new wave of interest and research, leading to a collaborative international effort to crack the Maya code. Scholars such as David Kelly, Tatiana Proskuryakov, and later Linda Scheller and David Stewart, among others, made significant contributions. Proskuryakov, in particular, was instrumental in demonstrating that many inscriptions were historical records of Maya rulers and their deeds rather than purely mythological texts as previously thought. This shifted the direction of Maya epigraphy towards historical reconstruction. One fascinating theory that has emerged from the study of Maya texts is the advanced nature of Maya astronomy and mathematics. The decipherment of the Dresden Codex, one of the surviving Maya books, revealed complex tables for predicting lunar and solar eclipses, the movements of the planet Venus, and the cycles of the Maya calendar. At the heart of their astronomical studies was the observatory at Chichen Itza, known as the Caracol. This structure, with its distinctive round dome and strategically placed openings, served as a window to the heavens, allowing Maya astronomers to accurately track the movements of Venus, the Sun, and other significant celestial entities. The precise alignment of the Caracol's windows with these celestial bodies' appearances and disappearances throughout the year underscores the Maya's advanced architectural skills and their capacity to harmonize their construction efforts with their extensive knowledge of astronomy. This integration of astronomy into various aspects of Maya life highlights a civilization that valued the stars not merely as subjects of curiosity, but as essential guides for earthly endeavors. The Maya's legacy in astronomy evidenced by their codices, observatories and calendars, offers a glimpse into a society that found harmony in the cosmic order and sought to align its terrestrial activities with the celestial rhythm. It's a tale not too dissimilar to the story of the Rosetta Stone and the Egyptian hieroglyphs, but with a twist. You see, the Rosetta Stone was like getting the cheat codes to understand Egyptian hieroglyphs because it had translations right there. But with the Maya, there wasn't a neat bilingual text lying around. Instead, figuring out what those intricate carvings and paintings meant required a mix of smart guessing, deep cultural dives, and a bit of detective work in understanding the symbols, not just as pictures, but as a complex blend of sounds and meanings. Now imagine trying to understand a writing system that's not only about what things are, but also how they sound. And that's what the Maya script is all about. It's this incredible collection of over 800 different glyphs, making it one of the showiest, most elaborate scripts you could lay your eyes on. And the coolest part, we're still unlocking the secrets of this ancient script. The Maya script's ongoing decipherment is a reminder that history isn't just about looking back. It's a story that keeps evolving as we learn more.